So we're, we're going to talk about mindfulness, being present, feeling at ease in the moment um, based on some spiritual tools and specifically uh, from uh, the understanding of the films of Alfred Hitchcock. That's at least, I hope to, with, with Hashem's help, we'll get to that point. And if I don't get back to that point, I'm not finished yet, so remind me to get back to that point. Yeah, we're going to speak a little bit about Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah, because it's going to help us to show up for our lives. Okay, and that, that's what we want to do. We want to show up for our lives. So just, just a little review. Uh, if, if you weren't here or you didn't watch online the first two classes in this series, it's not necessary. You don't, you don't need to. But uh, last week, we spoke a little bit about the idea of the spiritual canaries, you know, the canary in the coal mine. The, the canary senses the danger, the poisonous gas, before the miners because the canary is more sensitive. And we spoke about people who are just more sensitive. We, we, we described it as people who are like uncomfortable in their own skin, uh, that, that, that existential angst. There's other ways of describing it as well. You could call it lonely in a crowded room, <laughs> always wanting to be a part of instead feeling apart from. Um, and and I, I think I explained that at length last week. I'm not going to talk about that more. Uh, but what I do want to mention is that after last week's class aired, Baruch Hashem, we have a very nice crowd that comes here to the Levi Yitzchuk Library here in Cedarhurst. And, uh, but we also have people watching online. So after last week's class aired online, I got uh, a call from a friend of mine, uh, Yankee Raskin, who is a therapist. And he also is the director of the student wellness department at Ole Teira, uh, the yeshiva in Crown Heights. And they have an entire uh, department devoted to student wellness. And yeah, and my friend Yankee Raskin is the, is the head of that department. And uh, anyway, and he's a licensed therapist. So he was, an ex he's also a chassid. He's a, a Chabad chassid. So he was listening to last week's class, and he reacted to something that I said about, you know, the people who have a hard time living in this world. Who, the people who, you know, if you were here, you saw last week, we spoke about the people who have just a hard time with, with life itself. And he said to me something I had heard once, but I, I had forgotten, that there's a, we have a tradition that the Alter Rebbe, we call, in Chabad we call him the Alter Rebbe. Others call him the Balatanya, uh, Rav Schneer Zalman of Liadi. And it happens to be, nothing happens to be, but it happens to be Hashkocha Pratis, Divine Providence, would dictate that tonight, if you're here live at least, is Chof Dalad Tevis, which is the yard site, the Hilula, the anniversary of the passing of Rav Schneer Zalman. Rav Shneer Zaman ben Baruch, Zeicher Tzadik v'Kaddish Levrocha, Tzchuse Yogen Aleinu. Anyways, we have a tradition that the Alter Rebbe said that his chassidim, his students, his followers, the people who gravitated toward him, were special neshamas. He said they were neshamas who were in Gehenna, in hell, in purgatory, and who were pained by the concealment of godliness. And they were crying out in anguish from the concealment of godliness in, in, in hell. And they were shown mercy, and they were given the opportunity to be reincarnated and come back in this world, and they came back as these people, these agitated people who were desperately looking for this godliness that, 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 that had been concealed from them. And then they found the Alter Rebbe, and they just kept on grabbing and grabbing as much godliness as they could get with a desperation, with a hunger. 
and those are the chassidim of, of the Alter Rebbe. So, my friend the Yankee told me this, and I said, you know, that resonates a lot with me. Um, I once heard, <laughs> I don't know if there's something a rabbi should say, but uh, you know the difference between religion and spirituality? And this is not to negate religion. I, I, I happen to be a religious Jew. I believe in religion. I'm a, I'm a member of an organized religion. Well, Chabad, kind of organized. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a saying, <laughs> what's the difference between religion and spirituality? They say religion is for people who are afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people who have been there. And similarly, there's a, there's a saying, from the wisdom of, of the rooms, something get, that, that's shared often in the rooms of recovery. And I, and I do believe, I can't remember because it was like 13 years ago, but I think I included it in God of Our Understanding. Somebody just sent me today a picture of God of Our Understanding, a stack of them on sale in a bookstore in Jerusalem, which is nice to know the book's still in print. Um, is, there, is there a bookstore in Jerusalem called Pomerantz? Yeah? Okay, that's where it was. So, shout out to Pomerantz Bookstore in uh, Jerusalem. So, I think, I'm almost 100% sure that it, it's included in God of Our Understanding. It says, what are the directions for recovery? Go to hell and make a U-turn. <laughs> in other words, this is not something that somebody does from a situation of calm and quiet and everything is going well and then hey why not just for the heck of it let me go become super spiritual no this is something that happens from a situation where there are no choices left and we're gonna have to do something really drastic all right we have no choice left we're gonna give our life and will over to the care of God um, and, and that's I guess what we were talking about last week. By the way, somebody uh, wrote to me afterwards and, and said, I watched your class last week and I really related to what you said because I'm also a spiritual person. And I wrote back and said, I specifically said I'm not a spiritual person. You guys heard that. I said, I'm not a spiritual person. So I just want you to know, if, you, if you're a spiritual person and you're relating to me, please stop. Okay, you know, that's not, no, 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 no. If you're a non-spiritual person who happened to have just found spirituality in spite of himself, then, then you're, <laughs> you're a kindred spirit with me. Okay, so let's talk about solution-oriented. Let's talk about how we're going to do this. How are we going to get out of this state of, of agitation and how are we going to find... yeah. Oh, he was, Rabbi Raskin was the one who reminded me this, that, that the Alter Rebbe had said that his chassidim were these souls who were trapped in hell and came out and reincarnated. Yeah, that's what he had told me, yeah. And then when he told me that, it reminded me of some corroborating statements, statements that sort of echo that. But, yeah. So, yeah, let, let, let's talk about tools, real tools, to find uh, a... a a state of calm, of well-being, an ability to show up, to be present, all that good stuff. I'll, I'll start with a story about some nervous people. The, the story took place in Brooklyn, and specifically at 770 Eastern Parkway, which is Lubavitch World Headquarters. And these nervous people were actually in attendance at a fabrengen of the Lubavitch Rebbe. And... Uh, I know the exact date, I mean, it was, I actually was listening to a recording last night, an audio recording of the event, and it's also transcribed in the Sichas Kodesh. It took place on Chof Shvat, Tavshin Lamed. So just about like three weeks from now will be the anniversary of that date. We're talking about the winter of 1970. At any rate, there, long story short, there was a group who had come to New York from out of town, from overseas, and they needed to fly back that night out of JFK. And they were at the Rebbe's Fabrengen, 
And the Rebbe would fabreng, the Rebbe would speak many talks, very deep talks, weaving all types of uh, Torah teachings together, and uh, interspersed with, with Hasidic melodies. It was a whole, it was a multi-faceted sort of thing, and it took many, many hours. And uh, there was no, like, real end time, so you didn't really know how long it's going to go. The Rebbe would sometimes speak four, five, six hours um, without notes. I mean, just, it would just go and go. So there was a group of people who had a plane to catch. They had to get a plane from JFK. And so in the middle of the Fabrengen, the Rebbe starts telling a story. And at first it just it sounds like it's a story, like, okay, whatever, a story. The Rebbe told a lot of stories. So the Rebbe said, one time I was in Leningrad and I went into my father-in-law's office. The Rebbe's father-in-law was the Friedrich Rebbe, the sixth Rebbe. And... Uh, I saw him calmly sitting at his desk, just like it was the middle of a regular work day, except it wasn't. It was the middle of the night, and he had a, uh, a train to catch in an hour, and he had just spent the entire evening giving personal audiences, yechidus, one-on-one -on -one meetings with people, where he would hear them bear their souls, and he would connect to them and give them guidance. That itself is exhausting. And now he's about to head to the train station. That itself can make anyone feel preoccupied. You know, like if I have a plane to catch today, don't even talk to me the whole day. It doesn't matter what time the plane is. Like, I can't, it's it. I'm sorry. Can't think straight. Talk to me tomorrow. And to top it all off, he was taking the train, the Friedrich Rebbe was taking the train to go meet with a, uh, a capitalist, somebody who was not necessarily so... Uh, favorably viewed by the communists, and uh, the Friedrich Rebbe was going to meet with him to raise funds for underground Jewish activities, which was also not so favorably viewed by the communists. So you're talking about somebody, the previous Rebbe, who was under surveillance, state surveillance, um, from people who did not play around. They were not hesitant to arrest people and to execute people. And in fact, later they, they did arrest the previous Rebbe. And, and the Rebbe walked into the office and, and, and he saw the image of his father-in-law just sitting at the desk calmly working on, with, with papers at his desk like it's the middle of a regular work day. And here he is at the end of these exhausting one-on-one -on -one meetings, about to catch a train. And where's the train going to take him? To a meeting with somebody who really... He could get in trouble for even meeting and especially get in trouble for what he's raising funds from this person in order to do. The whole thing is very, very stressful. And his father-in-law just looked totally normal. And the Rebbe said, it, I was taken aback. And, and, and I said, you know, I know that Tanya teaches that mayach shalat alalev, that the brain is supposed to rule the heart. And, and you can't let your emotions carry you away. You have to have self-control. He says, I, I know that. But, and, and I'll just tell you the words that Rebbe said, Ad kedekach, which means to such an extent, it doesn't really, in translation, it doesn't really convey, the, it's, it's, it's an exclamation. It's like, really? Like, <laughs> to that extent? Like, yeah, I know that Chassidus teaches that you have to have control over your emotions, but this is, this is beyond. And it's interesting to me that that's what, that's what the Rebbe reacted to. That that was the image that, that caught the Rebbe's attention. That itself is instructive. Like, even a tzaddik can be a little bit nervous can be a little bit distracted, especially when you have so much going on, right? And so the fact that the previous Rebbe was not at all distracted, and he was totally present, the Rebbe was taken aback, and he said, Ad kach, to such an extent. And he said, my father-in-law then proceeded to, to explain to me that we cannot create more hours in the day, but we can use the hours that we were given. And it's called Hatzlocha Bizman, being successful with your time. 
and he proceeded to give examples of people who were successful with their time, including his own grandfather, the Rebbe Marash, the fourth Chabad Rebbe. And uh, he explained, you got to use a moment. You have a moment, you're given this moment, not at the train station yet, so I have this moment now. Why should I waste this moment because of something I have to do several moments from now? So then the Rebbe said, now remember, I told you what was the situation. This is in 770. The Rebbe, this is in 1970. In 770, the Rebbe's thinking about back in Leningrad. And all of a sudden the Rebbe says, there's some people here right now who are very nervous. And uh, it's because they have a plane to catch. And they're not sure how long this Fabrengen is going to go on for. And they know they have a lot to do. They have to go to the, their guests where they're staying and they have to pack up and they have to say goodbye and they have to get a car and they have to go to, to JFK. And uh, because of that, they're not present. They're physically in attendance, but they're, but they're, they're not present. They're not really here with us because their mind is on this plane that they have to catch. And uh, some of them are looking at the clock, which is a distraction. Or even worse, that I've said, they're straining to not look at the clock, which is even a greater distraction. And uh, if they would reflect upon what's written in Shar HaYichud Ve'amunah, they would not be stressed, they would not be nervous, they would be totally present. Now what's written in Shar HaYichud Ve'amunah? What is Shar HaYichud Ve'amunah? It's a, it's a volume of Tanya, second volume of Tanya. It's about cosmology, the study of the origin of creation. And it speaks about the nature of existence, that essentially Hashem is creating everything, something from absolute nothing at every single second. That's what it says. In short, that's what it says over there. So the Rebbe says, if they would think about what it says in Shari Yechid Ve'amun, and the, the group of people who were stressed out about the flight they had to catch, these were Chabad Chassidim, so they had certainly studied Shari Yechid Ve'amun. They knew what the book said. They were familiar with its contents. So the Rebbe said, if they would think about what it says in Shari Yechid Ve'amun, they wouldn't be nervous. Because they would realize that the plane that they need to catch has not even been created yet. Right now, all that exists is right here and right now, and the plane they need to catch will exist when they need to catch it. But right now, that plane, that same plane that they're going to catch an hour and a quarter from now, I think is the time that they ever said, which shows you there was no TSA back in 1970. Because <laughs> it was still possible to get from Crown Heights to JFK and catch an international flight in an hour and a quarter. Uh, remember those days? Yeah, okay. The plane that they need to catch in an hour and a quarter from now doesn't exist yet because everything's created every single second. So that's not now. An hour, from, an hour and a quarter from now is... is, is, is the, the plane will be created at that moment. But, but now, it's, it's not the same plane. So why are you thinking about a plane? It's not even your plane, it's a different plane. <laughs> right now, think about the, the, the immediate environment that's being created around you, for you, the, right now, here, here and now. And then you're going to be present. So, I mean, this is a deep concept. You want to be present, you have to think about Shara Yichad Ve'amunah. And if you're going to think about Shara Yichad Ve'amunah, if you're going to think about the fact that Hashem is creating everything from absolute nothing at this very second, you're going to be relaxed. You're going to be in the moment. You're going to be completely present. Okay. So, let's talk about that. Sounds like a good idea, right? Okay. So let, let, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, I'm going to try to explain a little bit more what this idea means. 
there was a Jewish thinker, Reb Carl Sagan. Remember him with the turtleneck back in the 70s? The Cosmos. Before they had Neil deGrasse Tyson, they had Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan was a Jew. And he claimed to be an atheist, which, that's fine, he could claim to be an atheist, but he, he made a joke that is so Jewish, it's not only Jewish, it's Hasidic. I'm going to tell you the joke. The joke is like this. He said, what are the instructions for baking an apple pie from scratch? Step one, create the heavens and the earth. It was a joke. You could laugh. It's okay to laugh at. Should I tell it again? <sighs> I have to apologize to Carl Sagan. It's enough that my jokes always bomb. But now I'm telling Carl Sagan's joke. It's a hilarious joke. Maybe I didn't tell it well. You didn't get it? You're making apple pie from scratch. So if trees already grow with apples, that's not from scratch. It's like if you buy a mix, that's not from scratch, right? Okay. So what does from scratch mean? It means without raw materials. So if the world already exists and there are trees growing from the ground and then, then apples grow from the trees, that's not from scratch. So he says the, the instructions for baking an apple pie from scratch, first create the heavens and the earth. That's from scratch. In other words, <laughs> something from nothing. So let's think about something from nothing. I think pretty much everyone today believes that the world didn't always exist. And I'm not going to quibble about six days of creation or Big Bang because that's actually not even relevant to this point. The point being that I think everyone agrees that existence, at least existence as we know it, wasn't always here. There was a beginning point. And, and I'm not going to argue about how long ago that point was when I think pretty much everyone today agrees that there was a beginning point. I mean, the Greek philosophers said that it always existed. So it's, don't, don't assume that, 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 that don't, take, don't take that for granted that everybody knows that. Okay, but today, basically everyone believes there was a, there was a beginning point where existence emerged from non-existence. Okay. So what does that mean? That means that every something was once nothing. And because it was once nothing, even now, it is essentially nothing and only being compelled to be something against its will. Okay, how did I make that logical leap? Because, and follow me here, this is a, this is a little bit technical, technical Kabbalistic stuff. Um, the Alter Rebbe in Shari Yechad explains that the ongoing existence of the world that we see, that we observe all around us right now, is a greater miracle than the most iconic miracle in the Bible, which is, according to Universal City Studio Tour, Parting of the Red Sea. Yes, of course. Parting of the Red Sea. Um, the ongoing existence of the phenomenological universe is a greater miracle than the iconic Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. How so? So he explains very simply. The splitting of the sea, we know the mechanics of that. The Torah tells us that there was a strong east wind that was blowing all night. And the wind was powerful enough to act upon the water and to push the water and to cause the water to stand like a wall. In other words, the mechanics of the splitting of the sea was something from something. It was a manipulation of the form of a something into another something. For instance, when, and this is the metaphor that the, 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 the Alter Rebbe himself uses, when the silversmith takes a hunk of silver and he melts it down and then he makes a vessel out of it, what has he done? He didn't create silver. He manipulated the form. He changed the shape of this chunk of silver into a, into a cup. Now, here's the thing. 
when you change the external form of something, it tends to stay put. It tends not to revert to its previous condition. And the reason is because it's not a major imposition to change the external form of something. You know, you could take this podium and you could take it apart and collapse it into pieces. And it'll, it's not going to reassemble itself. It's not going to strain to come back into this shape because you just changed the shape. It's not a big deal. Or you could even burn it and turn it into ashes. You could take this whole podium and turn it into a little clump of ashes. This, you're just changing the form. It's not going to revert. It's not going to reassemble. Okay, you, you're saying, I know that. What are, you, what are you trying to get at? What are you explaining? Okay, so let me tell you what this is in contradistinction to. When I say, when you, when you change the form of something, it tends to just stay changed, as opposed to what? As opposed to what? As opposed to when you change the essence of something. When you change the essence of something, as opposed to the form, which is an external or superficial or secondary quality, when you change the essence of something, then it doesn't tend to stay put. In fact, it tends to strain to revert to its essence. In fact, that's kind of the definition of essence. Essence means what the thing is. So, for instance, and this is just a metaphor, it's just a metaphor and it's a crude metaphor um, in the sense that it's the best I could approximate here in this very uh, informal laboratory. But let's say this pen. Okay, this pen. The shape of the pen is not essential to the pen. And I mean, I could prove that pretty quickly just by disassembling the pen, right? Okay, and it'll, it'll stay that way. Okay, but, or I could melt it, I could turn it into like mush. Um, I can't get it back together. Look what I did, ruined my pen. Okay. It's all for the sake of science, it's okay, okay. But what's essential to the pen? Um, one thing that's essential to the pen, at least according to Newton, would be that it's inert. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest, right? Now, I could override that and I can impose movement upon the pen, right? But it doesn't want to keep going. It wants to revert to being inert, to not moving. Because essentially, it's not moving. It doesn't move on its own. It can be moved, but it, it itself doesn't move. And that's sort of, again, it's just a metaphor, but that's sort of like an example of what happens when you try to override the essence of something. So <clears throat> it doesn't want to stay put. It wants to go back to what it really is. So you think about it like this. Every something was once nothing, however long ago in your narrative that was, but every something was once nothing. It wasn't always here. Existence wasn't always here. Okay, so it was nothing. I don't know a lot about nothing, but I'll tell you one thing I do know about nothing. Nothing doesn't exist. And therefore, to make nothing exist, you following? What I mean is to force nothingness into a state of somethingness is not a minor change. It is not a change to a secondary or superficial characteristic of the nothingness. To force nothingness into a state of somethingness is to override its very essence. And as such, nothingness is never comfortable in a state of somethingness and is always automatically straining. I don't want to personify this, but forgive the, the anthropomorphism, but it's, it's straining to go back to its true self, which is non-existence. And that's why creation, per se, 
is ongoing. It's not something that happened. It's happening. And as the Kabbalah teaches us, if the Holy One, blessed be He, were to stop speaking the world into being, that's how He creates. He creates through divine speech. If He were to stop speaking the world into being, the world would disappear without a trace. It would be gone. It would leave no it would leave no empty space behind. Because even that is, 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 is among the trappings of existence. In fact, not only it would no longer be here, it would never have been here in the first place because it would lose everything, including its history. That is how totally dependent created existence is upon the Creator imposing it into its state of creation. Therefore, Shari Yechid tells us that really only God exists because the world, although it exists, it doesn't really have its own existence. Not in the absolute sense. It is completely dependent upon Hashem's existence, imposing it into a state of existence at every single moment. Which means not only is it totally dependent, meaning it depends on being forced into existence, it depends on being forced into existence for everything about it. So that's total, qualitatively speaking. But also quantitatively, it's always, it's constantly dependent. Completely and constantly. You follow what I'm saying? Qualitatively and quantitatively. Everything that exists depends on being forced into existence, and it depends on that for it's everything. And it depends upon that all the time. There's no lag time. If, if, if God stops speaking the world into being, there's no, there's no lag time. It's not like if you, you pull the batteries out of a, out of a toy, how, how long will it keep moving before... Uh, before it stops moving after you, you know, after you cut the power. There's no lag time. Because every single second, I mean, a second is too big, but I don't know what time, unit of time to use. Every created being is dependent upon being forced into creation. So, if that's the case, then really, everything at this moment is being created exactly as the Creator in His infinite wisdom has decided to create it. And if so, it follows. How can I be distressed? You know what I took a long time to learn in life? Just because things are not in my control doesn't mean that things are out of control. Yeah, they're not in my control. But they're perfectly under control. It wouldn't exist right now at this second if it weren't completely under control. There are no accidents. This isn't some uh, turnkey operation that's just running on its own. Not only is God watching and knowing everything, he's existing, he's, made, he's creating as it exists at this, very, at this very moment. Now, we might not always like the way he creates it. And I think that's honest to say that. In fact, I'm skeptical of anyone who doesn't say that. I don't even think, if somebody doesn't ever point out that much of God's work is abhorrent, I don't believe they really believe in God. Because I think they're just going along with the premise, yeah, 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 it's all good. But if you really buy into this, if you really believe that God is choosing to create everything as he's creating it at this second, then yeah, let's be honest. Sometimes my aesthetic does not agree with his. I don't really, I'm not digging this. I'm not appreciating this scene right now, okay? And that's okay. That's valid. As they say, that's just your opinion, man. So that's okay. That can be your opinion. 
You know my favorite story? Do you guys know I, I get a perverse thrill from telling stories that are not dramatic? Because I feel, yeah, can I just editorialize for one second? It has nothing to do seemingly with this class. But I think a lot of rabbis and public speakers, they, they love to tell like Hollywood stories, like with a, like a really dramatic ending. And so, yeah, I hate that. So uh, <laughs> I love if I can thwart that by telling a story where like nothing happens. So this is my favorite story. It really is, it's not just I like telling it because it pains people, but I really do love this story because it's so deep. But it's only deep if you're ready to work for it. Like if you want like an exciting story, like, oh, and then the portraits threw the family in the dungeon and they had until sundown to get the 100 rubles. No, it's not that, it's not that kind of story. But this is, this is, my favorite story in the world. Okay, here, here's the story. The, uh, the students of the Mizritcha Magid were sitting around and discussing, having a, what do you call it, DMC, deep meaningful conversation. And they were discussing, if you were God, if you were God, what would you do if you were God? So the first one to speak was Rav Levi Yitzchak Berdichever, the great lover of the Jewish people. He was the, the, he was the defense attorney. He could always find a positive spin. And uh, so he was a real loving, gentle, kind person. And uh, it, his answer was sort of reflective of that. He said, well, if I were God, I would create the world with more chesed. Chesed is God's attribute of loving kindness. So the world would be a, a softer place an easier place to live. Rav Pinchas Koritzer was the, the next one to speak. And Rav Pinchas was, he was known as sort of stern. He was sort of an introvert. He was actually very much an introvert. Uh, he, he liked truth. And as such, he sort of shunned uh, social interaction. And he was just a real stickler for, for MS. Anyways, he said... Um, you know, if I were God, I would create the world with more gvura, God's attribute of judgment, so that the, the wicked people wouldn't be able to get away with their shenanigans, you know, with a little, bit of, a little bit more justice in this world, make the world a safer, more fair, more equitable place, so people can't, you know, take advantage, going to crack down on that. And then they asked the al Rebbe. And the Altareva said, if I were God, I would create the world exactly as God is creating it right now. That's the story. My favorite story. Not dramatic. Not if God were me. Oh, you guys, if I were running for the position of God, if that were like a, an elective position, I'm telling you, I would be so, I would be very benevolent. Like, if I were God, no one would ever get a paper cut again. That's what, if, if I were God, okay. But this is, <laughs> at least these are my campaign promises until I get into office and I find out what it actually takes to do the job. But those are my intentions. At any rate, but it's not if God were me, it's if I were God. In other words, Hmm, if I were God, if I were God, if I were God, if I had infinite wisdom, infinite power, infinite possibilities to do anything, to choose any reality, what reality would I choose at this second? Hmm. Look around, there's your answer. Exactly how I was creating the world this second. That's how, that's how you would create it, if you were God. If you knew everything that he knows, you would create it exactly, apparently, you would create it exactly as he's creating it right now. Hmm? So when you talk about Hestara, there's no difference between Hestara in the real world because it's exactly how Hashem expected it to be. So like right. Hestara. So uh, essentially, this, this gets us past the concealment because we realize that even the concealment is revelation. That even Hashem's hiding is revelation. Or the metaphor that's used is it's like a turtle. Have you ever seen a turtle? No, you only saw its shell. Kahadin kamtsa de luvushe mineyube, says in Tanya. Like the turtle whose clothing come from it. 
So did you ever see the turtle? No, you only saw the turtle shell. Yeah, except for the turtle shell is the turtle. So I never saw God. I only saw what God hides behind. And what is God hiding behind? God. Dif there are different divine names, and that's what Shari Yichad teaches us. There's Havaya, which is transcendent revelation. There's Elakim, which is the same numerical value as Hatava, the nature, which means the natural orderly uh, system that becomes predictable and therefore seems non-miraculous. But it's really Havaya hiding behind Elakim. It's God hiding behind more God. So I can't see God because God is blocking God and all I see is God. That's the reality. So, <laughs> and do you understand why this world existing right now at this second is more miraculous than the splitting of the sea? Because the splitting of the sea was changing the form of something that already exists. The water already existed, just making it stand up, which is overriding a secondary characteristic of it, which is to flow. But that's not that hard. You're just changing something that's incidental to the water. It's not essential to the water. In other words, <laughs> you understand, I, we don't normally think this way, but like what's essential to water or to any created being would be that it takes up space. So how could you have a created being that doesn't take up space? That, that, that itself would be overriding its essence. But to say water flows, okay, it happens to flow. That's how it usually does, it flows. But we could override that. And by the way, I override the fluidity of water on an almost daily basis in my freezer. Yeah, I have an ice cube tray. And it's not, it's not permanent. I mean, it does eventually melt, but yeah, it's, it's very doable. But to change the essence of something that, that, that doesn't stay. That doesn't stay on its own. So therefore, the fact that this podium has continued to be here solidly the entire time, that's taking more divine intervention than it did 3,300 whatever years ago for God to take the sea and to push it up and turn it into a wall for a night. And if that's the case, then the emotional takeaway is I have to know everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be right now. It's not in my control, fine, but it's not out of control. It's perfectly under control. And God knows what he's doing. Do I know what he's doing? No, I don't know what he's doing. But that's okay, that's called humility. That's called humility. Humility means I, I don't understand everything. I don't understand the nature of existence and why things have to be the way they are. I don't. I know that they need to be the way they are. I just don't understand always why they need to be the way they are. That's, that's just humility. You know what humility is? I'll tell you, there are two words that are very closely related but the experience of them are very different. And, and, and those words are humility and humiliation. Very different experiences. Now the end result of both humility and humiliation is the same. It's an admission of powerlessness. But the process is very different. The way you get to that end result is very different. Humility it's, admits its power... Humility admits its powerlessness with, with dignity, with grace. Humiliation goes down kicking and screaming. It's not supposed to be this way, and I'm going to fight it. But apparently it is. And I'm not saying to be a fatalist and to cast a... Uh, a decree, and to say, because it's this way at this second, it's always going to be that way. God forbid. We're very hopeful people, and we believe that God can do anything. So I'm not saying to be a fatalist who says, because 
the situation is this way right now, it's going to continue to be this way. We believe there can be a dramatic turn for the better, and, and, and better meaning the way that I appreciate better, according to my understanding, of course, and that's called bitochen, that's called trust, that things will improve in a way that I'll be able to understand it easily. But I'm not talking about a second from now, I'm talking about right now, this second that God is creating right now. I have to know that it is perfect perfectly imperfect, that in its imperfection it is perfectly what it needs to be for now. And it's in development. God's going to create a whole new universe a second from now. But for right now, the, the universe that God is creating at this second is exactly the universe that he needs to be creating at this second, for now. And therefore, I'm not going to protest. I'm not going to go down kicking and screaming and fighting and, you got the wrong guy, you, got, you, you misunderstood, you didn't read the memo. My father may be, well, I think I've mentioned many times as a psychologist. So I was like 15 years old, and he says to me, Son, what is the difference between psychosis and neurosis? Now, growing up in my home, I understood that that was the setup for a joke. So you play along, right? The, you, you have the straight man, the funny guy, so, you know, like Abbott and Costello. So what do you respond? You're playing the straight man, so you say, I don't know, what is the difference between psychosis and neurosis? So my father says, psychosis is when I think that 2 plus 2 equals 5. Neurosis is when I know 2 plus 2 equals 4, but I can't stand it. I know 2 plus 2 equals 4. I'm not crazy. I'm not deluded. I'm not living in an alternate reality. I know 2 plus 2 equals 4, but it shouldn't! You understand, if God is creating the world in a certain way at this moment, that is a 2 plus 2 equals 4 fact. And you can scream all you want, you can protest all you want, that it's not to your liking, it doesn't change the fact. Now, as I said earlier, I'm not telling you to lie about your feelings. You know, there's this obnoxious, oh, the, the, well, the people use this statement in an obnoxious way. Feelings aren't facts. I know feelings aren't facts, but feelings are feelings. And it's a fact that I have this feeling. So, <laughs> I'm not saying that when God's way of creating right now is unpleasant to me, I'm not saying I'm right and he's wrong. I know he's right. I'm allowed to have my feeling about it. I find it unpleasant. I don't even understand how somebody could daven if they don't admit that they find the present moment unpleasant. How do you pray? How do you ask God to do anything different if you don't say, oh, by the way, yeah, God, I know you're doing a perfect job right now, so perfect that it's way beyond my ability to appreciate, hint, hint. <laughs> God, you are doing such a perfect job, it would take an infinite mind to even see how it's good right now. Yeah, it's like, hold on, backhanded compliment. Um, but God, listen, how about a second from now, you make things in a way that I could appreciate? Because I'm not appreciating it right now. I know it's good. I know it's good. I'm not denying it's good. I just don't get it. <laughs> I'm not getting it. I'm not in on the joke. Okay? And those are two separate things. Those are two separate things. It's okay to have your opinion. The Rebbe said so many times, Asetut ve Shreitman. If it hurts, you say, ow. You're allowed to say, ow. You're allowed to say ow. Just don't then go and take your ow and say, and therefore I know that God is getting it wrong at this moment. No, he's not getting it wrong. He's getting it right. You just don't like this moment, which is fine, which is fair, which is honest. But see, here's the thing. When we understand that the moment is being created something from nothing, brand new, in its entirety, at this second. So, at least it calms us that, like, we're not in the wrong place. <laughs> it's like, sometimes we think, at what point did my life go off track and did I stop living the life that I was supposed to have lived? Am I the only one who thinks that at 3 in the morning, right? <laughs> At what point did things start to get bizarre? And could I have changed it if I only, I don't know, if just had some better boundaries maybe? Or 
a little bit more confidence. At what point did my life spin out of control? <laughs> really, I'm the only one who thinks about that. Hmm? Oh, Hitchcock. We're going to get to Hitchcock. We're going to get to Hitchcock. What? Yeah, how did I get here? Yeah, and sometimes I know how I got here, and it's like, <clears throat> at what point <laughs> did God's plan for me become supplanted by a bunch of stuff that happened because of my dumb mistakes, <laughs> right? And, and you start feeling like, like, I'm not even supposed to be here. and like, That's wrong. That's wrong. It's absolutely wrong because... God never surrendered control for one second. Even while you were doing stupid stuff, God was creating you, he was creating the situation, he was creating other people's reactions. And you are exactly in the right place right now. And your life is exactly the way that it needs to be right now. And I'm not cursing you, I'm not saying nothing's going to ever change if there's something painful in your life. And I got news for you, until Mashiach comes, we're in Gullis. And Gullus means that everyone has something painful in their life. And I'm not telling you that, God forbid, if there's something painful in your life right now, it's not going to change. Of course it's going to change. It's going to change in a way that we'll be able to see that it's better. But for now, just for now, for this very second, I'm not even talking about a second from now, but this second right now, it's perfect. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be. So just show up. What do you want to say? Hishtadlis is for a second from now. I told you. We're not talking about a second from now. Second from now, make better choices next time. Say no next time. Next time, we're going to handle it completely different. And also, not just how we're going to behave, but have bitoch and have trust. Hashem's sending something really, really good that I'll even be able to appreciate with my finite mind. And it's coming, it's coming soon. But that's a second from now. I'm not talking about a second from now. I'm talking about this second. This second, the only ishtadlis, it's a Hebrew word for effort, the only effort required of you at this second is to live it. That's right. Show up for it. To show up for it. That's the only effort required of you at this second. Show up for it. Reb Zushia was on his deathbed. He was crying. Actually, interestingly enough, I saw recently that Eric Fromm told this story, but he didn't mention uh, Zusha's name. I don't know if everyone knows Eric Fromm, a psychoanalyst uh, from uh, Heidelberg, Germany. He was from a German-Jewish family. Then later he lived in the United States and then in Mexico. He was uh, a, also a great thinker and a social critic. Interestingly, I don't think a lot of people know, even those who, who are familiar with the works of Fromm, that Eric Fromm, when he was in Heidelberg, he used to study, I think for a period of five or six years, he used to study Tanya every single day <clears throat> with a Chabad Chosid by the name of Zalman Rabinkov. And, yeah, and Eric Fromm said that Rabinkov was the most influential teacher in my entire life. Yeah. So I saw recently that Fromm told this story of Reb Zusha, although he didn't mention... The, the name, which was interesting. He just said there was a rabbi once who was lamenting. He said, uh, anyways, the story is Zusha was, was, was crying. He's about to pass away. He's going to be judged. His life's going to be judged. And so his students said, Rebbe, you lived a life of perfect purity and piety. How can you be afraid of judgment? And if you're afraid of judgment, it doesn't really bode very well for the rest of us. So, so Zusha says, my dear students, I'm not afraid I'm going to get up there and that they're going to review my life, and they're going to, and they're going to say, uh, Zusha, why weren't you like Abraham, our patriarch? I'm not afraid I'm going to get up there, and they're going to review my life, and they're going to say to me, Zusha, why weren't you like Moses, our teacher? But I'm terrified I'm going to get up there, and they're going to review my life, and they're going to say to me, Zusha, why weren't you like Zusha? And Fromm tells the story, and he says that every person has a unique potential and that his purpose in life is to live up to his unique potential. But here's what I want to tell you. What does it mean for Zusha not to be Zusha? How is it possible not to be Zusha? I mean, wherever you go, there you are. So you're always going to be you. You can't escape being you. But that's not entirely true. Because like the Rebbe told that group of people who are nervous about the flight, that you're physically present, but you're not really here. 
So it is possible to live your entire life, biologically speaking, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you're checked out. You're not showing up. So what happens when you find the way God is creating this moment disagreeable? Oh, this is not the way it was supposed to happen. And so therefore you check out and you distract yourself or you self-medicate. Some use chemicals, drugs. Some go up, some go down. Some look at screens all day, some gamble. Some get into high-risk activities. The adrenaline itself is the distraction. Some people get into drama. The codependents like to get into other people's drama. But anything to distract myself from life as God is creating it at this second, right? And, and what we're saying is, if you don't show up for moments, the end of the life, you, you look back, was I me? Did I show up for my own life? How many of the moments of my life was I not even really there for because I found it unacceptable? I didn't agree with the way God is creating the world at this second. I, I disagreed with some fact of my life. And I'm not saying you did anything wrong by being pained by it because I made that very clear. That's, that's, that's a legitimate response. And I told you already, I'm very skeptical of anyone who never cries out and says, God, please, it hurts. Stop. Stop it already. I can't take it. I'm very, very skeptical of anyone who never responds that way. But at the same time, don't tell God he's getting it wrong. Don't tell him he's getting it wrong. Because at this moment, in his infinite wisdom, he's creating it exactly as it is, from whole cloth, from absolute nothingness. There's no mistakes. We can't see it? Okay, we can't see it. We have finite minds. We can't see it. But we know, we know. And not just we believe axiomatically. I explained to you that it's impossible that created existence continues independently. It is impo I explained it to you logically. Why? Why am I explaining it to you logically, even though I know it's a little bit boring? Why? Because later on, if I just tell it to you as an article of faith and I say, we believe that everything is divine providence. Later on, your mind is going to start working. You're going to say, why do we believe that? Why, why, I don't know. Maybe I don't believe that. Do we really believe that? And that's why Chassidus Chabad, Chochmah Bin Adas, which means the three intellectual faculties, is about explaining as much as possible the, why the things that we believe also make sense. So I'm not pretending to explain to you why everything in your life happened the way it happened, because nobody knows that, certainly not I. But I could explain to you how we intellectually know that everything that happens is the way that it's supposed to happen. And, and, and the way that we understand it logically is that the physical world is not ontologically independent. Sorry to use big words. But it does not have its own independent existence. It has to, by definition, it wasn't always here, so even now, it's being put here. And it's not just being put here haphazardly. Every single detail of it, the arrangement of subatomic particles is being meticulously orchestrated at every single nanosecond. And it's impossible that it would be any other way, yeah. We have tremendous power. I, I, but I'll, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll put it right back on you. I'll put it right back on you. I'll put it right back on you. Two plus two equals four. Can you change that? No. But if you can't stand it, you can change that. Follow what I'm going to tell you. Chazal tell us, Hakol bidei shamayim, Everything is in the hands of heaven except for one's awe of heaven. What does that mean? It's a categorical statement. Hakoil bidei shamayim means everything. Not 99.9%. .9%. Everything that's happening is exactly the way Hashem wants, wants it to be and only Hashem. There's no other Deya Zagar. There's no one else with an opinion. Chutz, with the exception, where, where's our power? Where's our power? in our mind, in our heart, Yiras Shamaim. That means our awe of heaven. 
Or, to explain it a little bit more fully, will we choose at this moment, we didn't choose the moment, but at this moment, will we choose to live in awe of the one sole author of the moment? Or do we choose to live in awe of people, places, and things? So what is free choice? Free choice is the power to know and to accept where our life is coming from at this moment. That's our free choice. Our Yir Shemayim is our free choice. And therefore, to make decisions that are befitting our awe of the one creator and the one author. In other words, to choose to behave morally, according to his morality. To do what is right in the eyes of God. Now, how that's going to go down, whether it's going to work, whether I'll succeed, whether I'll fail, whether people will compliment me for it or curse me for it, I have no control. So, shtatlis and bechira and all these terms, what do they have to do with? They have to do with the ability that I have the autonomy to choose my emotional reaction and my behavioral choice in the moment, and that's it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that you can't think that way. Yeah, that's again, but that's exactly what I was saying before. That's what I was saying before. That's that's a, that's a mythology. That's a mythology. That's a narrative that we make up in our minds to explain why our life is the way that it is. It's not true. It's not true. <sighs> Yeah, so the reality is that whatever else is going on, Hashem is in charge. Hashem can do anything. Hashem wants good for us. And that's it. And that's it. And I wish, especially in the situation where you're talking about where someone's using religious ideas to torture themselves, I wish the religious idea that people would ruminate on would be the one of ongoing creation and that God is kind and all-powerful and, and making the world exactly the way it's supposed to be, instead of ruminating on other religious ideas that give people an excuse to be depressed and to give up on life. So, anyways, the bottom line, bottom line is, should I say it in a cheesy way? I'll say it in a cheesy way. Why not? We like cheese sometimes. Um, every moment is a gift. That's why it's called the present. The present. <laughs> So God is creating it. I got to show up for it. And not to reject it. To live in it. Okay, Hitchcock. When I was a very young rabbi, I would eagerly accept any offer to speak to any crowd. Even if I had no business doing so. So this is back in the... It's got to be, I don't know... 2005, I got a call from an organization called Gilda's Club. Gilda's Club is named after Gilda Radner, Allah Shalom, who was a comedic actress and a Jewish woman who passed away at a very young age because of uh, ovarian cancer. And her husband, Gene Wilder, Allah Shalom, also a Jew, in her memory, he's, he's passed away since, but after she passed away, Gene Wilder created a, an organization called Gilda's Club, and it's, a, it's like a clubhouse where people with any form of cancer, it's not specific which form, but anyone who has cancer can come there. It's not a medical facility. It's a, it's a social services organization, and they provide social uh, programs. So I got a call from Gilda's Club, and they said, Rabbi... And I don't even know how they found me. Like, this is before, I, as I remember, this is before, like, the, the ubiquity of Google. This is probably like a Yellow Pages type thing. So they, they probably were just going randomly. 
through the yellow pages, but they, they, they called me and said, Rabbi, would you come and speak at Gilda's Club about faith in the face of adversity? And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Okay. So then I realized these people are all there because they have cancer. And I'm going to speak about faith in the face of adversity. Like, who am I? And the most likely outcome is I'm going to say something I think is inspiring, and I'm going to offend them, God forbid, which is the last thing that I want to do. And, and, but this only occurred to me as I was pulling up to the <laughs> place. I was really eager. I had my whole talk, and everything's for the good. And then I'm like, are you going to tell people who are battling a serious illness, everything's good, everything's good. Like, what am I doing here? So actually... I was pulling up, and I, ch and I ch had a change of heart, and I was going to drive off. The lady, I really was about to drive off. I got carjacked. Not literally carjacked, but effectively. The lady who was the organizer of the place, she saw me. She recognized me. She opened up the door of my car. She opened the door. She's like, Rabbi, come on. They're waiting. So I was stuck. So I'm walking with her. I'm walking down the steps. There's like these... It was in a basement. It was in a, in a, like a social hall in a basement. So we're, we're walking down the steps, and I'm thinking to myself, this is terrible. <laughs> okay, here's what I'm going to do. If at any point they say to me, you're offending us, I made up my mind already. I'm just going to say, you're right, I'm sorry, and I'm going to be done. And that's it. That's all I'm going to do. By the way, I did not make that decision when I walked into here tonight. So you can tell me I'm offending. I'm going to keep going. But as I'm walking down the stairs, I'm like, that's it. If they tell me you're offensive, I'm going to be like, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. And I'm just going to stop. Okay. So then I was relieved. At least I have a plan. But I go a couple more steps down the stairs. And I'm like, no, this is not a good plan. There's a flaw to my plan. The flaw to my plan is, I don't know if you guys realize this, but people look at me. And they tend to associate me with Judaism. Yeah. I was in the airport last week. I was in Atlanta. Some, some guy comes home and he says, Rabbi. I'm like, yeah, how do you know? <laughs> I, don't know. I forget. So it's not a good plan because it's okay if they think I'm an idiot. It's not okay if they think that 3,000 years of tradition is irrelevant or offensive or anything like that, God forbid. It's called a chilol Hashem. It's called a desecration of Hashem's name. It's not, it's not cool. So I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I had to go. I was walking up already. So I came up with a plan on the fly. I'm like, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm totally just going to make something up. Okay, but here's what. There was a method to the madness. I'm going to totally make something up. If they like it, we'll leave it alone. Okay? If they don't like it, if they say, you're offending us, so here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say to them, you know, I really regret that I made this all up. I should have told you what Judaism has to say. <laughs> you get it? That, okay, don't judge me. That was, I had like two seconds to come up with a plan. Okay, but you get it? Like I have an out. I can always throw myself under the bus and be like, yeah, that was just something I made up because I'm an idiot. That's not what Judaism says. Next time get a real rabbi and he'll tell you what, what Judaism says. Okay. The best I could come up with on the fly. So I get up there and I say, and I'm just, I'm going to make something up, completely made up. So I get up there and I say, I was thinking the other day. Well, that part wasn't made up because I had been thinking previous to that event. But not about what I said I was thinking. It wasn't even true. I don't even know. Why, why do people do that? When they, like The other day. Just Why does it make it more? Anyways, I was thinking. I, I wasn't really thinking the other day. I thought about it that moment, like on the spot. I said, I thought, I was thinking the other day about French New Wave cinema. About the Nouvelle Vague. And they were very into what they called auteur theory. Author theory. The, the, the French New Wave Cinema filmmakers, they weren't just filmmakers, they studied cinema. And they would talk a lot about what makes great cinema. So one time they were sitting around, they're having like a little cinematic fabrengen, as I envision it. And one of the guys there was Francois Truffaut. 
and uh, they asked him, well, they asked everybody, who's the greatest auteur? Who's the greatest film author? And they all had like, their different answers. And they came to Truffaut. They said, who's the greatest film author? So Truffaut says, hands down, Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock is the greatest film author. Okay. I'm not going to tell you whether that's my opinion or not. I'm telling you this is, this is, this is how it happened. That's what Truffaut said. Hitchcock's the greatest film author. So they said, Francois, that's great, but why? Why is Hitchcock, in your estimation, the greatest film author? So Truffaut says, one reason. Because in his entire career, in his entire massive body of work, all the hours of film that he put on the screen, and there's not one single superfluous shot. If Hitchcock put it on the screen for even a second, it had meaning. It had to be there. It was integral to the storytelling. There was no filler. So in my estimation, that's what makes Hitchcock the greatest film author. That's what Truffaut says. So I'm at Gilda's Club. I say, I'm asking myself this question. In yeshiva, they taught me how to like make logical arguments. So I'm thinking to myself like this. Could I say as much for God and the film that he's making about me and showing to me that God has managed to do as well in that movie as Truffaut says Hitchcock managed to do in his career? I thought about that and I said to myself, well, it's a Kalvachimer. Logically, yes, it must be. Because who made Hitchcock? <laughs> God made Hitchcock. So if Hitchcock could do it, then the one who made Hitchcock could certainly do it. So, yes, it is possible I could say that my life is a story without a superfluous shot. Now, let me explain what that means. That does not mean that it's all pleasant, agreeable, likable. No, not at all. However, that actually makes sense to me too, because once I start thinking about it in narrative terms, protagonist, antagonist, conflict, resolution, three-act structure, that whole thing, well, then it becomes obvious to me that a good story isn't a story with all good moments. In fact, we would say that's a very bad story. That's a boring story. Nothing happened. Nobody ever threw a novel across the room and said, I can't believe what trash this is. The main character who I'm supposed to like wants something and he keeps on not being able to get it. Nobody said that that's a bad story. To the contrary, that's called a page turner. Let's see if he gets it. He's down for the count. There's no way he can come back. That's compelling. That's a narrative. That's a story. That's a good story. And the more impossible it seems for the protagonist to eventually accomplish his goal and then to accomplish it anyway, and it not to be a contrivance, that's storytelling. So is it possible there are moments of my life that are unpleasant? Horrific! Moments of my life that are horrific! And yet, If I'm looking at it as a story, it's, it's, it's not a bad story. It's not a bad story. He's not wasting my time. You know, the Baal Shem Tov taught that everything we see and everything we hear is a message from God. This is not just talking to the prophets who actually heard God's voice. The Baal Shem Tov said, each and every one of us who is awake to reality will see communication, teachings from the Creator in everything that occurs to us, everything that happens. That's how God speaks to us, through our lives. I heard somebody once say that in school, you, you, you're given the lesson and then you take the test. And in life, you take the test and you're given the lesson. How do we learn? We learn through experience. School of hard knocks. Now, I don't wish it on anyone. 
certainly not myself, I wish us all an easy life. I told you already, if I were running for God, no more paper cuts. <laughs> but I can understand, if I'm looking at it purely from a narrative perspective, I get it, I get it, I get it. I can say from my <sighs> director of my film, that he's at least as good as Hitchcock. He's at least as good as Truffaut thought Hitchcock was. So, but hold, hold on here. I told you already that I made that up. That was my ability that if they got offended, I'm going to apologize and going to tell them I'm just some crackpot who says stuff that he made up. So at that point, I heard a voice, and I want to explain something to you as best as I can try to convey this. You know how sometimes you're aware of somebody's presence before you've actually looked at them? You haven't really... With your five senses, maybe you don't know they're there, but somehow you're, you know that they're there. There was a woman in the room who was a very strong presence, and it's almost like I felt she was going to speak the whole time. and. At one point, at this point, I hear a booming voice. And she said one word. She said, Rabbi! And it was like that. That's the best impression I can. Rabbi! Like a booming voice like that. And I looked. And I was like, oh yeah. I can't explain it other one, uh, in any other way than to say. I looked. I was like, oh yeah. Like, yeah, that's, that's you. I didn't know who she was. I never met her. I don't think I had looked at her at that, till that point. But I was like, yeah, that's that energy that I was aware of. And, and, and I'm like, yes. And she says, I have to say something. And in my mind, I'm trying to work out something, something else now. Because I already have a plan that I'm about, I'm about to apologize. But at this point, I'm trying to adjust the booming voice with this very frail body. Because she was very, very frail. In fact, when she spoke, she stood up. And I remember thinking to myself, distinctly, I remember thinking to myself, I hope she doesn't hurt herself, because when she was standing, she was so frail, when she stood up, I was afraid she was going to get hurt. But her voice was booming. So she's like, Rabbi, and she stands up. I have to say something. Like, yes, and I'm ready. And she says, my friends all think that I'm crazy when I tell them, no, I don't wish that I, I, don't wish that I never got cancer. They say, oh, no, you're giving up. You, she says, I'm not giving up. I'm, I'm, I want to live many healthy, happy years. Oh, so you wish you never got it. No, I don't wish I never got it. She says, we get into this loop that's like this silly semantic argument. To them, it is. And she says, it's very frustrating to me, and I feel very lonely, because this is very important to me. This is a very important idea to me, and I cannot communicate it to my friends. No, I don't wish that I never got it. I don't wish that I never got it. I don't. I want to live, yeah, I want to live, but I don't wish that I never got it. And I don't know how to explain that paradox to them until now. She says, until now. Now it's very simple to me how to explain it. There's only one reason why I don't wish that I never got it. One reason. And the reason is because I did. I did get it. That is what happened. So now, retroactively, to wish to have not gotten it means to wish for some other life. Because that's not what happened in my life. In my life, I did get it. Now, in my life, I'm looking forward to living. That's the future. That's open. But as far as the past, that's what happened in my life. So to now wish that that wasn't what happened in my life would be to wish for some other life. She says, I don't want to live some other life. I don't want to live some other story. I want to live my life. I want to live the story that God is telling me. This was like the most powerful moment for me, for me in my personal life, the most powerful moment of just that's what faith is. That's what faith is. That's what it is. That's what it is. She said it. She said it. 
I don't want to live some other life. I don't want to live some other story. I want to live my life, my story, the story that God is telling me. That's what faith is. That's all it is. That's everything. See, because you want to know, you want to know, you know what, you want to know what it means that this woman wanted to live? Animals want to survive. Animals want to not die. They have a survival instinct. She was a human being. She wanted to live. You know what it means to want to live? To want to live doesn't just mean to want to stay alive in the future. To want to live means to want your life. To want your life. Not some other life. Not some imagined life. Not some alternate universe life. Not some theoretical life. Not the life that you should have had, that you could have had that you imagined that you were going to have. To want to live means to embrace the perfection, the imperfect perfect of your life. Every detail of it. Every detail of it. What's going to happen a second from now? God has a big wide hand. Miracles can and do happen. We're not fatalists, God forbid. We're not dooming anybody that the situation will remain as it is. But everything until this point is exactly the story. And my director of my life doesn't put anything on the screen that doesn't need to be there. Yeah, he puts stuff on the screen that scares the hell out of me. He puts stuff on the screen that brings me to tears. He puts stuff on the screen that I say, why? Why are you doing this? I don't like this. Stop this. But he's not getting it wrong. He's telling a perfect story. And not just a perfect story in the, in the general universal sense. The perfect story for me. Zusha, why weren't you Zusha? I can show up for the entirety of Chase's life. That's what I can do. That's it. Every moment of it. Even the moments that I say to myself, I never thought that would happen to me. Or how about even better? I always thought if that would happen to me, I would die. And I'm here, so apparently not. Apparently I got that wrong too. Add it to the list of things that I don't have any idea about. That's humility. And it's not that hard to be humble before infinite wisdom. If I had infinite wisdom, if I were God, <laughs> I would also create the world exactly as it is right now and see how somehow it's perfect. But I'm not infinitely wise. So I don't see how it's infinitely perfect. But I know that it is. And therefore, who cares? Who cares if I know that it is? I'll tell you who cares. I care because when I know that it's perfect, even if I don't like it, I can show up for it. Not only am I empowered to show up for it, it's a moral imperative for me to show up for it. Because if I don't show, and what, you know what I mean when I say show up for it. I don't just mean physically to bring my body. Although sometimes that's the best I can do. And if that's the best I can do today, fine. I know God gives me credit for that too. But if I can possibly bring my, my five senses and I can possibly bring my mind and my attention and my focus, then yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And I'm going to have my life. Minute by minute by minute by minute. By just accepting. All I got to do is show up. All I got to do is show up. All I got to do is show up. That's it. That's it. All I got to do is show up. And you want to know something? Let's not be entirely like morbid over here. There are plenty of moments of life that are easy to show up for. Let's not forget that. Please, let's not forget that. There are moments that are nice and pleasant and not terrifying. <laughs> there are some pretty nice moments that are easy to watch. But even the moments that are not, you know what? It's my life. I don't want to live some other life. Okay? So, we're all going to meditate. We're all going to think about how the created universe has no ontological independence. We're going to think about the ongoing existence of this world as a dynamic product of an infinite act of God choosing meticulously every detail of reality at this second. And we're going to show up. 
minute by minute, second by second, and we're going to live our lives. Oh, one more thing. One more, I forgot to tell you one, one more thing. But you can't just meditate. There's something else you got to do. If you only meditate, it's not enough. Remember the story in 770? Where the Rebbe told them if they would think about what it says in Shari Yechid Ve'amona. So, uh, right after that, and I, I didn't catch this the first ten times that I, I read it, but now it occurred to me. I don't know if you know the Rebbe's style of speaking, but the Rebbe would interweave a lot of different subjects and flow in and out, and sometimes like come back to a point and tie up loose ends, and it was a very complex presentation. So you can't always follow the flow, is what I'm saying. You can't always figure out why the Rebbe is saying the next thing that he's saying. Um, right after the, the, the message to the nervous travelers, the Rebbe started speaking about saying l'chaim. And the Rebbe said, it's important to say l'chaim at a fabrengen. And it's not because it's alcohol, because our, our point is not to get drunk, actually. But the point is because it's physical. It's a physical thing. And we need to connect everything to a physical thing. The Rebbe kept saying it, adover gashmi. We need to connect everything to a physical thing. So we say l'chaim on, on a physical drink that we imbibe with our physical bodies. It finally occurred to me, this is the Rebbe saying this in 1970, this is cutting edge. There's two parts of this, of this therapy. One is the cognitive part, and that's probably the biggest part of it, is, I mean, the hardest part. You have to learn Shari Yechid you have to understand it, you have to meditate on it. But that's not all, because that can remain an abstraction. Then you have to ground it, and you have to make it physical, and you have to make it sensorial, you have to involve the body. So you think about these abstract concepts, the Chassidus teaches how Hashem is creating the world, something from nothing, every single second, but then you have to say L'chaim, because your body has to be part of it. It has to be somatic. It has to be sensorial. You have to bring it home and internalize it in a physical way. So that, that's the formula. You go to Fabrengen, you talk about God creating the world something from nothing every single second, and you say L'chaim, and then you're good. Until the next Fabrengen. Right? Okay, L'chaim. Okay, that was part three of our Anxiety and Amuna series. It stands for itself, but if you haven't seen parts one and two, check them out. Parts one and two, and you get the background that leads up to this class.